Leonora Carrington's The Hearing Trumpet. When Carmela gave me the present of a hearing trumpet, she may have foreseen some of the consequences. Carmela is not what I would call malicious. She just happens to have a curious sense of humour. The trumpet was certainly a fine specimen of its kind, without being really modern. It was, however, exceptionally pretty, being encrusted with silver and mother-of-pearl motives and grandly carved like a buffalo's horn. The aesthetic presence of this object was not its only quality. The hearing trumpet magnified sound to such a degree that ordinary conversation became quite audible even to my ears. Here I must say that all my senses are by no means impaired by age. My sight is still excellent, although I use spectacles for reading, when I read, which I practically never do. True, rheumatics have bent my skeleton somewhat. This does not prevent me taking a walk in clement weather and sweeping my room once a week on Thursday, a form of exercise which is both useful and edifying. Here I may add that I consider that I am still a useful member of society and I believe still capable of being pleasant and amusing when the occasion seems fit. The fact that I have no teeth and never could wear dentures does not in any way discomfort me. I don't have to bite anybody and there are all sorts of soft edible foods easy to procure and digestible to the stomach. Mashed vegetables, chocolate and bread dipped in warm water make the base of my simple diet. I never eat meat, as I think it is wrong to deprive animals of their lives when they are so difficult to chew anyway. I am now 92 and for some 15 years I have lived with my son and his family. Our house is situated in a residential district and would be described in England as a semi-detached villa with a small garden. I don't know what they call it here, but probably some Spanish equivalent of spacious residence with park. This is untrue. The house is not spacious. It is cramped. There is nothing resembling even faintly a park. There is, however, a fine backyard which I share with my two cats, a hen, the maid, and her two children, some flies, and a cactus plant called magui. My room looks on to the nice backyard, which is very convenient as there are no stairs to negotiate. I merely have to open the door in order to enjoy the stars at night or the early morning sun, the only manifestation of sunlight which I can abide. The maid, Rosina, is an Indian woman with a morose character and seems genuinely opposed to the rest of humanity. I do not believe that she puts me in a human category, so our relationship is not disagreeable. The magui plant, the flies and myself are things which occupy the backyard. We are elements of the landscape and are accepted as such. The cats are another matter. Their individuality puts Rosina into fits of delight or fury according to her temper. She talks to the cats. She never talks to her children at all although I think she likes them in her own way. I never could understand this country, and now I am beginning to be afraid that I will never get back to the north, never get away from here. I must not give up. Miracles can happen, and very often do. People think 50 years is a long time to visit any country, because it is often more than half a lifetime. To me, 50 years is no more than a space of time stuck somewhere I don't really want to be at all. For the last 45 years I've been trying to get away. Somehow I never could. There must be a binding spell which keeps me in this country. Sometime I shall find out why I stayed so long here, while I am happily contemplating reindeer and snow, cherry trees, meadows, the song of the thrush. England is not always the focus of these dreams. I do not, in fact, particularly want to install myself in England, although I will have to visit my mother in London. She is getting old now, although enjoying excellent health. A hundred and ten is not such a great age from a biblical point of view, at least. Margrave, my mother's valet, who sends me postcards of Buckingham Palace, tells me she is still very spry in her wheelchair, 
although how anyone could be spry in a wheelchair I really don't know. He says she is quite blind but has no beard which must be a reference to a photograph of myself which I sent as a Christmas gift last year. Indeed I do have a short grey beard which conventional people would find repulsive. Personally I find it rather gallant. England would be a matter of a few weeks. Then I would join my lifelong dream of going to Lapland to be drawn in a vehicle by dogs, woolly dogs. All this is a digression and I do not wish anyone to think my mind wanders far. It wanders but never further than I want. So I live with my Galahad, mostly in the backyard. Now Galahad has a rather large family and he is by no means rich. He lives on a small wage paid to consular employees, those who are not actually ambassadors. These, I am told, get a more ample salary from the government. Galahad is married to the daughter of the manager of a cement factory. Her name is Muriel and both her parents are English. Muriel has five children, one of which, the youngest, still lives here with us. This boy, Robert, is 25 and has not married yet. Robert is not a pleasant character and even as a child was unkind to cats. He also circulates on a motorcycle and introduced a television set into the house. From that time on my visits to front regions of our residence became increasingly rare. If I ever appear there now it is always rather in the nature of a spectre, if I may say so. This seems to give a certain relief to the rest of the family as my table manners were becoming unconventional. With age, one becomes rather less sensitive to the idiosyncrasies of others. For instance, at the age of 40, I would have hesitated to eat oranges in a crowded tram or bus. Today, I would not only eat oranges with impunity, but I would take an entire meal unblushingly in any public vehicle and wash it down with a glass of port, which I take now and again as a special treat. Nevertheless, I make myself useful and help in the kitchen which is next door to my room. I peel vegetables, feed the hens, and as I mentioned before, carry out other violent activities like sweeping out my room on Thursdays. I give no trouble at all and keep myself clean with no assistance from anybody. Every week brings a certain amount of mild enjoyment. Every night, in fine weather, the sky, the stars and of course the moon in her season. On Mondays, in clement weather, I walk two blocks down the road and visit my friend Carmela. She lives in a very small house with her niece who bakes cakes for a Swedish tea shop, although she hears Spanish. Carmela has a very pleasant life and is really very intellectual. She reads books through an elegant lorgnette and hardly ever mumbles to herself as I do. She also knits very clever jumpers, but her real pleasure in life is writing letters. Carmela writes letters all over the world to people she has never met and signs them with all sorts of romantic names, never her own. Carmela despises anonymous letters and of course they would be impractical as who would answer a letter with no name at all signed at the end. These wonderful letters fly off in a celestial way by airmail in Carmela's delicate handwriting. No one ever replies. This is the really incomprehensible side of humanity. People never have time for anything. Well, one fine Monday morning, I went to my usual visit to Carmela, who was actually waiting for me on the doorstep. I could see at once that she was in a state of high excitement, as she had forgotten to put on her wig. Carmela is bored. She would never go onto the street without her wig on ordinary occasions, as she is rather vain. Her red wig is a kind of queenly gesture to her long-lost hair, which was almost as red as her wig, if my memory is correct. This Monday morning, Carmela was uncrowned with her usual glory, but very excited and mumbling to herself, which is not her ordinary habit. I had brought her an egg, which the hen had laid that same morning. I dropped it as she clutched my arm. This was a great pity, as the egg was now beyond repair. I was waiting for you, Marion. You are twenty minutes late, she said, taking no notice of the broken egg. Some day you will forget to come at all. 
Her voice was a thin shriek, and this was more or less what she said, because of course I did not hear it all. She pulled me inside the house, and after several attempts gave me to understand that she had a present for me. A present, a present, a present. Now Carmela has given me presents several times, and they are sometimes knitted and sometimes comestible, but I never saw her so excited. When she unwrapped the hearing trumpet, I was at a loss to know whether it could be used for eating or drinking or merely for ornament. After many complicated gestures, she finally put it to my ear and what I had always heard as a thin shriek went through my head like a bellow of an angry bull. Can you hear me, Marion? Indeed, I could. It was terrifying. Can you hear me, Marion? I nodded speechlessly. This frightful noise was worse than Robert's motorcycle. This magnificent trumpet is going to change your life. Finally, I said, For goodness sake, don't shout. You make me nervous. A miracle, said Carmela, still excited, when then, using a quieter voice, your life will be changed. We both sat down and sacked a violet-scented lozenge, which Carmilla likes because it scents the breath. I am now getting used to the rather nasty taste and beginning to like them through my fondness for Carmilla. We thought about all the revolutionary possibilities of the trumpet. Not only will you be able to sit and listen to beautiful music and intelligent conversation, but you will also have the privilege of being able to spy on what your whole family are saying about you, and that ought to be very amusing. Carmilla had finished her lozenge and had lit a small black cigar which she reserves for special occasions. You must, of course, be very secretive about the trumpet because they might take it away from you if they don't want you to hear what they are saying. Why should they want to hide anything from me? I asked, thinking about Carmela's incurable passion for drama. I don't give them any trouble and they almost never see me. You never know, said Carmela. People under 70 and over 7 are very unreliable if they are not cats. You can't be too careful. Besides, think of the exhilarating power of listening to others talk when they think you cannot hear. They can hardly avoid seeing the trumpet, I said doubtfully. It must be a buffalo's horn. Buffaloes are very large animals. Of course you must not let them see you using it. You have to hide somewhere and listen. I hadn't thought of that. It certainly promised infinite possibilities. Well, Carmela, I think it is very kind of you, and this mother-of-pearl floral design is very pretty indeed. It looks Jacobean. You will also be able to listen to my last letter, which I haven't sent yet, as I was waiting to read it to you. Ever since I stole the Paris telephone directory from the consulate, I have increased my output. You have no ideas of the beautiful names in Paris. This letter is addressed to Monsieur Belvedere Ouastnossi, Rue de la Recte Potin, Paris L. You could hardly invent anything more sonorous, even if you tried. I see him as a rather frail old gentleman, still elegant, with a passion for tropical mushrooms which he grows in an empire wardrobe. He wears embroidered waistcoats and travels with purple luggage. You know, Carmela, I sometimes think that you might get a reply if you didn't impose your imagination on people you have never seen. Monsieur Belvedere Ouastnossi is undoubtedly a very nice name, but suppose he is fat and collects wicker baskets. Suppose he never travels and has no luggage. Suppose he is a young man with a nautical yearning. You must be more realistic, I think. You are sometimes very negative-minded, Marion, although I know you have a kind heart. And that is no reason that poor Monsieur Belvedere Ouastnossi should do anything so trivial as collecting wicker baskets. He is fragile, but intrepid. I intend to send him some mushroom spore to enrich the species which he had sent from the Himalayas. There was no more to be said, so Carmela read the letter. She was pretending to be a famous Peruvian alpinist who had lost an arm trying to save the life of a grizzly bear cub trapped on the edge of a precipice. The mother care had unkindly bitten off her arm. She went on to give all sorts of information about high-altitude fungus and offered to send samples. It seemed to me that she took too much for granted. When I left Carmela's house, it was almost lunchtime. 
I carried my mysterious parcel under my shawl, walking very slowly in order to reserve energy. I was feeling quite excited by this time and had almost forgotten that there was to be tomato soup for lunch. I have always been very fond of tinned tomato soup. We do not have it very often. My state of slight exhilaration gave me the idea of walking through the front door instead of going around the back way, which is my usual procedure. I had a faint idea of stealing one or two chocolates from Muriel, which she hides behind the bookcase. Muriel is very mean about sweets, and she wouldn't be so fat if she were more generous. I knew she had gone downtown to buy anti-macassars to hide grease spots on the chairs. I dislike anti-macassars myself and prefer washable wicker chairs, which are not so depressing as cloth when dirty. Unfortunately, Robert was in the lounge entertaining two of his friends to cocktails. They all stared at me and looked away quickly when I began explaining that I'd been for my usual Monday walk. My diction is not quite as good as it used to be because of having no teeth. My monologue has not gone on for long when Robert took me roughly by the arm and ejected me into the passage leading to the kitchen. It was obvious that he was angry. As Carmela says, one can never trust people under seventy and over seven. As usual, I ate lunch in the kitchen and went to my room to comb Marmeen and Chakta, the cats. I comb the cats every day in order to keep their long fur smart and glossy and to reserve the hair I get off the combs for Carmela, who has promised to knit it into a jumper when there is enough. I have filled two small jam jars with the nice soft hair. It seems a pleasant and economical way of having warm clothing for the winter. Carmela thinks that a sleeveless cardigan is a practical garment for cold weather. I have been four years now filling the two jars, so it may take some time to get enough wool to make a complete garment. It might be possible to weave a little llama wool with it, although Carmela says that would be cheating. Rosina's cousin once brought me the present of a simple Indian spinning wheel. I have been trying it out on cotton waste and spinning nice and useful ropes. By the time I have enough cat's wool to spin, I should have learnt enough to spin fine yarn. This is an enterprising occupation, and I must say I would be fairly happy if I did not feel so much nostalgia for the north. They say you can see the pole star from here and that it never moves. I have never been able to find it. Carmela has a planisphere, but we cannot discover how to use it, and there are so few people one can consult on such matters. When I had hidden the hearing trumpet carefully, I set about my afternoon's work. The red hen looked as if she was laying another egg on my bed, and Marmin was objecting to having his towel combed out, all as usual. The sudden apparition of Galahad in the room almost knocked me off my chair. The last time my son visited me was when the tank burst and he came in with the plumber. He stood mouthing in the door. I suppose he was saying something. Then he put a bottle of port wine on my chest of drawers, mouthed some more and left. This astonishing behaviour from Galahad left me pensive till evening. There was no reason I could think of to explain his visit. It was not my birthday, and he never gave me a birthday present. Judging from the weather, it was not Christmas. Why should he make such extravagant changes in his habits? At that time, I do not think I attributed any ominous interpretation to the event. I was merely curious and surprised. Of course, if I had Carmela's gift of perceptive psychology, I might, even then, have been a little preoccupied. In any case, even if I had foreseen the events that followed, there was nothing I could have done except wait. A great deal of my life has been spent in waiting, most of it quite fruitless. Recently I do not go in for much coherent thought, however on that occasion I actually made a plan of action. I wanted to find out the motive for Galahad's unwanted kindness. Not that he lacks ordinary human sentiment, simply that he considers kindness to inanimate creatures a waste of time. He may be right, but on the other hand, the Maguri cactus seems alive to me, so I feel I can also make claims on existence. When the evening drew on and dinner time was past, I waited for Rosina to retire and then, unwrapping my hearing trumpet carefully, I left my room 
and went and hid in the dark passage between the lounge and the kitchen. The door here was always open, so I had no trouble taking in a nice picture of family life. Galahad was sitting opposite Muriel near the fireplace which had an electric log. This was out, as the weather was not too chilly. Robert was sitting on the narrow sofa, tearing the morning paper into strips. The new anti-macassars were hanging dutifully on the chairs and sofa. They were dark beige with fringes, practical, I suppose, and easy to wash. The three members of my family were engaged in some sort of discussion. Even if it never happens again, the result is intolerable, said Robert so loudly, and my trumpet vibrated. I shall never dare invite any of my friends here again. I thought everything was already decided, said Galahad. You don't have to go on being so excited when we have all agreed that you'd be much better off in a home. You always decide everything twenty years too late, said Muriel. Your mother has been a constant anxiety to us for the past twenty years, and you have been stubborn and inert enough to keep her here on our hands just to satisfy your own sentimentality. Muriel, you're being unfair, said Galahad weakly. You know we never had the means of keeping her in an institution before Charles died. The government provides institutions for the aged and the infirm, snapped Muriel. She ought to have been put away long ago. We are not in England, said Galahad. Institutions here are not fit for human beings. Grandmother, said Robert, can hardly be classified as a human being. She's a drooling sack of decomposing flesh. Robert, said Galahad without conviction. Really, Robert? Well, I've had enough, said Robert. Inviting people here for a normal chat and a drink and in walks the monster of Glamis, gibbering at us in broad daylight until I have to throw her out. Gently, of course. Remember, Galahad, I added Muriel, those old people do not have feelings like you or I. She would be much happier in an institution where there's proper help to take care of her. They are very well organised today. This place I told you about in Santa Brigadier is run by the Well of Light Brotherhood and they are financed by a prominent American cereal company, Bouncing Breakfast Cereals Co. It is all very efficiently organised and reasonably inexpensive. Yes, you told me, said Galahad, who seemed bored by the discussion. I agree it seems the sort of place to send her. She will be quite well cared for there, I expect. So when do we pack her off, said Robert. I could turn that room into a workshop for the motorbike. There's no desperate hurry, said Galahad. She will have to be told. Told, said Muriel in surprise. She doesn't have any idea where she is. I don't think she will even notice the change. She might, said Galahad. You never can tell how much she understands about anything. Your mother, replied Muriel, is senile. The sooner you accept that, the better. For a moment I took the trumpet away from my ear, partially because my arm ached. Senile? Yes, I dare say they were right. But what does senile mean? I applied the trumpet again to the other ear. She ought to be dead, Robert said. At that age, people are better off dead. Back in bed, wearing my woolen night shirt, I found myself trembling with an ague that seemed to belong to someone else. The dreadful recurrent thought was first. The cats, what will become of the cats? Then Camilla, what about Carmela? On a Monday morning and the red hen? And why do they suppose they know that one is better off dead? How can they possibly know that? And oh dear Venus, I always pray to Venus, she's such a brilliant and recognisable star. What is the well of light brotherhood? That sounds more terrifying than death itself. A brotherhood with the grim knowledge of what is better for other people and the iron determination to better them whether they like it or not. Oh, Venus, what have I done to deserve that? And what about the cats? What will become of Marmine and Chichita? I shall never spin their wool into a cardigan to warm my bones. I will never wear cat's wool. I shall probably have to wear a uniform. No red hen to lay a daily egg on my bed. Tormented by all these horrible visions and thoughts, I dropped into something near to catalepsy, then sleep. Naturally, I visited Carmela the next day to tell her the dreadful news. I took my hearing trumpet as I hoped for some advice. There are times, said Carmela, when I am clairvoyant. When I saw that trumpet in the flea market, I said to myself, 
That is just the right thing for Marion. I had to buy it at once. I had a premonition. This is terrible news. I must try and think of some plan. What do you feel about the Well of Light Brotherhood? I asked. It frightens me. The Well of Light Brotherhood, said Carmela, is obviously something extremely sinister. Not, I suppose, a company for grinding old ladies into breakfast cereal, but something morally sinister. It all sounds terrible. I must think of something to save you from the jaws of the Well of Light. This seemed to amuse her for no reason at all, and she chuckled as though I could see she was quite upset. They will not allow me to take the cats, you think? No cats, said Carmilla. Institutions, in fact, are not allowed to like anything. They don't have time. What shall I do, I said. It seems a pity to commit suicide when I lived for ninety-two years and really haven't understood anything. You might escape to Lapland, said Carmilla. We could knit a tent here so you wouldn't have to buy one when you arrived. I have no money. I could never get to Lapland without money. Money is a great nuisance, said Carmela. If I had any, I would give you some, and we would take a holiday on the Riviera on the way to Lapland. We could even gamble a little. Even Carmela had no practical advice. Houses are really bodies. We connect ourselves with walls, roofs and objects, just as we hang on to our livers, skeletons, flesh and bloodstream. I am no beauty, no mirror is necessary to assure me of this absolute fact. Nevertheless, I have a deaf grip on this haggard frame, as if it were the limpid body of Venus herself. This is true of the backyard and the small room I occupied at that time. My body, the cats, the red hen, all my body, all part of my own sluggish bloodstream. A separation from these well-known and loved, yes, loved things were deaf and deaf indeed, according to the old rhyme of the man of double deed. There was no remedy for the needle in my heart with its long thread of old blood. Then what about Lapland and the furry dog team? That would also be a fine violation of those cherished habits. Yes, indeed. But how different from an institution for decrepit old women? In case they lock you up in a temp-story room, said Carmilla, lighting a cigar, you could take a lot of those ropes you weave and escape. I could be waiting down below with a machine gun and an automobile. A hired automobile, you know. I don't suppose it would be too expensive for an hour or two. Where would you get the machine gun, I asked, intrigued at the idea of Carmilla armed with such a deadly artefact. And how do they work? We never succeeded in operating the planisphere. I must suppose that the machine gun would be more complicated. Machine guns, said Camilla, are simplicity itself. You load them with a lot of bullets and press a trigger. There is no intellectual manipulation necessary and you don't have to actually hit anything. The noise impresses people. They think you're dangerous if you have a machine gun. You might well be dangerous, I replied, alarmed. Supposing you hit me by mistake. I would only press the trigger in case of absolute necessity. They might turn a pack of police dogs on us, in which case I should be obliged to shoot. A whole pack of dogs is quite a large target. Forty dogs at a distance of three yards would not be difficult to hit. I could always tell you apart from an angry police hound. I could not feel quite happy about Carmilla's argument. Supposing there is only one police dog chasing me around and around in circles, you might easily hit me instead of the hound. You, said Carmela, stabbing the air with her cigar, will be swarming down ten stories on your rope. The hounds will be attacking me, not you. Well, I said, still not quite convinced. After we have left the exercise yard, it would be an exercise yard, I suppose, surrounded by high walls, littered with dead police dogs, what would we do then and where would we go? We would join the gang at an expensive seaside resort and go on tapping telephone wires for horse race winners before the bookies pay out. Carmela was off on a tangent. I made an attempt to bring her back to the point of our discussion. I thought you said animals were not allowed in institutions. Forty police dogs are surely animals. Police dogs are not properly speaking animals. Police dogs are perverted animals with no animal mentality. Policemen are not human beings, so how can police dogs be animals? This was impossible to answer. 
Carmela ought to have been a lawyer. She was so good at complicated debate. You might just as well say that collie dogs are perverted sheep, I said eventually. If they keep so many dogs in an institution, I don't see what difference a cat or two would make. Think of the cats living in constant anguish amongst forty ferocious police dogs. Camilla stared in front of her with an agonised expression. Their nervous system would not survive a situation like that. She was right, of course, as usual. Still feeling crushed with despair, I hobbled back home. How I would miss Carmella and her stimulating advice, the black cigars, the violet lozenges. They would probably make me suck vitamins in an institution. Vitamins and police hounds, grey walls, machine guns. I could not think coherently. The horror of the situation floated in tangled masses in my head, making it ache as if it was stuffed with fawny seaweed. Force of habit rather than my own capacity carried me home and set me down in the back yard. Strangely enough, I was in England and it was Sunday afternoon. I was sitting with a book on a stone seat under a lilac bush. Close by, a clump of rosemary saturated the air with perfume. They were playing tennis nearby. The clump clump of the rackets and balls was quite audible. This was the sunken Dutch garden. Why Dutch, I wondered. The roses, the geometrical flower of beds, or perhaps because it is sunken. The church bells ringing, that is the Protestant church. Have we had tea yet? Cucumber sandwiches, seed cake and rock buns. Yes, tea must be over. My long dark hair is soft like cat's fur. I am beautiful. This is quite a shock because I have just realised that I am beautiful and there is something that I must do about it. But what? Beauty is a responsibility like anything else. Beautiful women have special lives like prime ministers, but that is not what I really want. There must be something else. The book. Now I can see it. The Towels of Hans Christian Andersen. The Snow Queen. The Snow Queen. Lapland. Little Kay doing multiplication problems in the icy castle. Now I can see that I also was given a mathematical problem which I cannot solve, although I seem to have been trying for many, many years. I am not really here in England in this scented garden, although it does not disappear as it norm nearly always does. I am inventing all this and it is about to disappear, but it does not. Feeling so strong and happy is very dangerous. Something horrible is about to happen and I must find the solution quickly. All the things I love are going to disintegrate and there is nothing I can do about it unless I can solve the Snow Queen's problem. She is the Sphinx of the North with crackling white fur and diamonds on the ten claws of every foot. Her smile is frozen and her tears rattle like how on the strange diagrams drawn at her feet. Somewhere, sometime, I must have betrayed the Snow Queen for surely by now I should know. The young man wearing white flannels has come to ask me something. Am I going to play tennis? Well, I'm not really very good, you know. That is why I prefer to read a book. No, not an intellectual book, just fairy tales. Fairy tales at your age? Why not? What is age anyway? Something you don't understand, my love. The woods are full of wild anemones. Now, shall we go? No, darling, I didn't say wild enemas. I said wild anemones, flowers, hundreds of thousands of wild flowers all over the ground, under the trees, all the way up to the gazebo. They have no smell, but they have a presence just like a perfume, and quite as obsessive. I shall remember them all my life. Are you going somewhere, darling? Yes, going to the woods. Then why do you say you will remember them all your life? Because you are part of their memory, and you are going to disappear. The anemones are going to blossom eternally. We are not. Darling, stop being philosophical. It doesn't suit you. It makes your nose red. Since I discovered that I am really beautiful, I don't care about having a red nose. It is such a beautiful shape. You are hatefully vain. No, darling, not really, because I have a frightful foreboding that it will disappear before I know what to do with it. I am so horribly afraid that I don't have time to enjoy being vain. You are a depressive maniac, and I would be bored stiff if you were not so pretty. Nobody could ever be bored with me. I have too much soul. 
Far too much, but lots of body too, thank heavens. The green and gold light in the woods, look at the great ferns. They say witches make magic with fern seeds. They are hermaphrodites. The witches? No, the ferns. Somebody brought that colossal bluish fir tree from Canada. It cost millions and millions. How silly to bring a tree from America. Don't you hate America? No, why should I hate America? I've never been there. They are frightfully civilised. Well, I hate America because I know that once you get in, you can never get out and you go on crying all your life for the anemones you will never see again. Perhaps America is covered from head to foot with wild flowers, mostly anemones, of course. I know it is not. How can you possibly know that? Not the part of America I am thinking about. They have other sorts of plants and dust. Dust, dust. Probably a few palm trees and cowboys galloping hither and thither on cows. They ride horses. Well, horses, does it matter when you are so sick to get home again that you wouldn't notice if they were riding cockroaches? Well, you don't have to go to America, so cheer up. Don't I? Who knows? Something tells me that I'm going to see a lot of America and I'm going to be very sad there unless a miracle happens. Miracles? Witches? Fairy tales? Grow up, darling. You may not believe in magic, but something very strange is happening at this very moment. Your head is dissolved into thin air and I can see the rhododendrons through your stomach. It's not that you are dead or anything dramatic like that. It is simply that you are fading away, and I can't even remember your name. I remember your white flannels better than I can remember you. I remember all the things I felt about the white flannels, but whoever made them walk about has totally disappeared. So you remember me as a pink linen dress with no sleeves, and my face is confused with dozens of other faces. I have no name either, so why so much fuss about individuality? I thought I heard the Snow Queen laugh. She seldom laughs. There I was, nodding away in my terrible old carcass, and Galahad was trying to tell me something. He was shouting at the top of his voice. No, I am not inviting you to play tennis. I am trying to tell you something very agreeable and important. Agreeable? Important? You are going away on a nice holiday, mother. You are going to enjoy it very much. My dear Galahad, don't tell me such silly lies. You are sending me away to a home for senile females because you all think I am a repulsive old bag and I dare say you are right from your own point of view. He stood mouthing at me, looking as if I had picked a live goat out of my bonnet. We expect you to be reasonable about all this, he yelled eventually. You will be very comfortable and have a lot of company. My dear Galahad, I wonder what you consider being unreasonable. Do you mean that I might tear the house down brick by brick and stamp on it? Throw the television set off the roof? Ride off naked on Robert's revolting motorcycle? No, Galahad, I do not have the strength for any of these reactions. I have absolutely no choice except being what you call reasonable. You need not worry. You will find that you will be very happy, mother. You will have all sorts of interesting pastimes and a trained staff to see that you are never lonely. I am never lonely, Galahad, or rather I never suffer from loneliness. I suffer much from the idea that my loneliness might be taken away from me by a lot of mercilessly well-meaning people. Of course, I never hope that you will understand me, so all I ask is that you do not imagine that you are persuading me into something when you are actually forcing me against my will. Really, mother, it will be for your own good. I know you will appreciate this later on. I doubt it very much. However, nothing I can say will change your opinion. So when do I have to go? Well, we thought we might drive you out on Tuesday just to have a look at things. If you are not pleased with the place, you can come right home again. Today is Sunday. Yes, today is Sunday. I'm glad to see you perking up, mother. You'll see what a fine time you're going to have making lots of friends and taking health exercise out in St. Brigadier. It is almost the country you know. What do you mean healthy exercise? I asked, prey to an awful premonition that they might have a hockey team. One never knows with modern therapy. I, I get plenty of exercise here. Organised sports of some sort, replied Galahad, confirming my fears. You're going to feel like a two-year-old after a month or two. 
I didn't seem able to get my breath properly. I held my peace in order to reserve energy. I had too many things to find out before falling stark into a grave. Besides, argument with Galahad was obviously unfruitful. He went on talking for some time, but I no longer heard what he said as he wasn't shouting any more. Some fifty or sixty years ago, I bought a practical tin trunk in the Jewish quarter in New York. This trunk has resisted time in all sorts of different surfaces. Recently I'd used it as a tea table when Carmela came to visit me. I'd only expected to pack it again when I would leave for Lapland. One can never be sure of the future. I had not opened the trunk for about seven years. That must have been the time Carmela came and gave me a bottle of sleeping potion that she made herself and that I never dared to taste. The bottle was still lying at the bottom of the trunk and had turned into a crystalline sediment which looked extraordinarily venomous, having a brownish tint with a grey fungoid growth around the top. I decided to keep it just the same. One never can know what might be useful. I never throw anything away. The trunk inside was made of solid wood and papered with a tasteful design which was slightly stained in places. The first object I packed next to the sleeping potion was, of course, the fatal hearing trumpet. This made me think of the angel Gabriel, although I believe he is supposed to blow his and not listen for it. That is, according to the Bible, on the last day when humanity rises to ultimate catastrophe. Strange how the Bible always seems to end up in misery and cataclysm. I often wondered how their angry and vicious God became so popular. Humanity is very strange and I don't pretend to understand anything. However, why worship something that only sends you plagues and massacres? And why was Eve blamed for everything? Then I had to open the chest of drawers and sort things out, and all the cardboard boxes with different labels, marmalade, glass, tinned beans, tomato ketchup. They did not, of course, contain what the labels said, but different odds and ends which agglomerate with me. One has to be very careful what one takes when one goes away forever. Something seemingly useless might become essential under specific circumstances. I decided to pack as if I were going to Lapland. There was a screwdriver, hammer, nails, birdseed, a lot of ropes that I had woven myself, some strips of leather, part of an alarm clock, needles and thread, a bag of sugar, matches, coloured beads, seashells and so on. Finally I put in a few clothes to prevent things rattling about inside the trunk. Knowing Mule to be an officious and nosy parker, and wanting to prevent any possible revision of my belongings, I filled the empty cardboard boxes with stones from the backyard and tied them up again with string, so that she would think I'd left all my miscellaneous collection behind. Mule would call it all rubbish and throw it away. Of course, I knew I was not going to bribe the Eskimos, but I put everything in it as if I were. Institutions like the Far North are also cut off from civilization, and you never know what people might want. I was not educated in a convent school for nothing. Time, as we all know, passes. Whether it returns in quite the same way is doubtful. A friend of mine, who I did not mention up till now because of his absence, told me that a pink and a blue universe cross each other in particles like two swarms of bees and when a pair of different coloured bees hit each other, miracles happen. All this has something to do with time, although I doubt if I could explain it coherently. This particular friend, Mr Marlborough, has been living in Venice with his sister, so I haven't seen him for some time. Mr Marlborough is a great poet and has achieved fame in recent years. At times I'd thought of writing poetry myself, but getting words to rhyme with each other is difficult, like trying to drive a herd of turkeys and kangaroos down a crowded thoroughfare and keep them neatly together without looking in shop windows. There are so many words and they all mean something. Marlborough tells me his sister has been a cripple from birth, although he says it so mysteriously, I sometimes wonder what is really the matter with her. If I remember correctly, writers usually find some excuse for their books, Although why should one excuse oneself for having such a quiet and peaceful occupation, I really don't know. Military people never seem to apologise for killing each other, 
yet novelists feel ashamed for writing some nice inert paper book that is not certain to be read by anybody. Values are very strange. They change so quickly I can't keep track of them. I say all this because I think I might write some poetry after all. I think a ballad would be rather in my style, with short simple verses such as Not a thing upon the floor, although I look from door to door, abandoned by my kith and kin, I'll leave them not a safety pin. Not anything pretentious with long words. This is merely an example, as I would actually favour something more romantic. With all these thoughts running through my head, like sand through a sieve, I continued my packing. It was quite a long job, but I had no desire to sleep. I was too preoccupied. Sleeping and waking are not quite as distinctive as they used to be. I often mix them up. My memory is full of all sorts of stuff which is not, perhaps, in chronological order, but there is a lot of it. So I pride myself on having an excellent faculty of miscellaneous recall. The cats were singing hymns to the moon, on the seashore just a silver spoon. This rhyming image never was finished. I must have dropped off to sleep after all. <laughs>